स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello everyone this is Dr Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing we were discussing about the biomolecules and in the previous uh, module we have discussed about the three biomolecules we have discussed about the nucleic acids and we have discussed about the carbohydrates and we have also discussed about the lipids and in the previous lecture we have discussed about the Uh, the proteins so we have started discussing about the proteins that the proteins are made up of of the amino acids and these amino acids are having a general structures where they have the uh, central c alpha carbon and on this central c alpha carbon we have the four different types of functional groups which are attached to each on one side it has the amino group on the other side it has the carboxyl group and the third side it has the hydrogen and the fourth side it has the functional side chains and based on the functional side chains the amino acid can be classified into four different groups uh, 20 different types uh, it could be vary from the very simple glycine to a very very complicated tryptophan and depending on the side chain uh, it can be of the different molecular weights and different types of properties so it could be a hydrophobic amino acids it could be a hydrophilic amino acid it could be a polar amino acids it could be negatively charged amino acid or it could be a positively charged amino acid and in addition to that we have also discussed in detail about the thin layer chromatography and how the thin layer chromatography can be used to analyze the different types of amino acids so in today's lecture we are going to discuss more about the protein structures so let's start discussing about the protein structures so the as it said you know protein is made up of of the 20 naturally occurring amino acids a typical amino acid contain a amino group and a carboxyl group attached to the central alpha carbon the side chain attached to the central alpha carbon determine the chemical nature of the different amino acids so what you see here is the you have the c alpha carbon and that c alpha carbon is attached to the four different types of functional groups and these four different types of functional groups and depending on the r side chains you can have the 20 different types of amino acids peptide bond is for connecting the two individual amino acids uh, in, and that's how it, they are actually giving the polypeptide chain each amino acid is linked to the neighboring amino acid through an acid amide bond between the carboxyl group and the amino group of the next amino acids every polypeptide chain has the free amino group and the free c terminal groups right that's why the primary structure of a protein is defined as the amino acid sequence from the end to the c terminals with a length of the several hundred amino acids so these are the 20 different amino acids what we have already discussed in the previous lectures so the primary structure is defined as the amino acid sequence from the n terminus to the c terminus right so do you see that it's it starts with the n terminus so this is the n terminus and then it ends up with making a combination with the all other amino acid to the peptide bond but ultimately with the last amino acid it is going to have the carboxyl group which is going to be free then that's why the protein is going to have the amino group and then it is going to have all the amino acids and then it is going to have the carboxyl group so that's why the i mean protein has the two ends one is n terminus and the other one is called as the c terminus 
the ordered folding of the polypeptide chain give rise to the 3d conformation known as the secondary structure of the protein such as the helix sheets and loops so this is what you see here is the primary structures right so all the protein all the amino acids are present and the first amino acid is actually going to have the n terminus whereas the last amino acid is going to have the c terminus when this primary structure is getting folded it is actually going to give you the secondary structures where you have the alpha helices these are the alpha helices then we have the beta sheets so you can see the beta sheets these are the beta sheets and then it also has the turns so these are the turns what you see here arrangement of the secondary structure give rise to the tertiary structures alpha helix and beta sheets are connected by the unstructured loop to arrange themselves in the protein structure and it allows the secondary structure to change their directions tertiary structure defined the structure of a protein and the enzymatic activity or the nature of the structural protein so when the secondary structures are joined together by the loops or the turn they are actually going to give you the tertiary structure so this is what you see here is the tertiary structures and if the protein has the multiple subunits then it is actually going to give you the quaternary structure for example in this case we have the subunit 1 2 3 and 4 so all these three sub all sub four subunits are coming together and that's how you are going to have the quaternary structures so different polypeptide chains are arranged to give the quaternary structure so different that's why if you want to understand the protein structures you have to understand all the three three four uh, different types of structures so we have the primary structures we have the secondary structures we have the tertiary structures and we have the quaternary structure so these are the different level of organizations what is present into the protein structures uh, so let's first start with the primary structures so the primary structures the amino acid sequence of a protein is known as the primary structure the order of the amino acid determine the folding of the protein to achieve the net minimum free energy and this is achieved in the multiple steps collectively known as the folding so if the primary structure is going to fold so this is what you see here is the primary structure right where you have the length of the amino acid now see here i am just showing you the single letter code of the different amino acid because it is almost impossible to write the full length or the full name of that particular amino acid because to save the space right and uh, these primary structures are actually going to fold to give you the secondary structures and that event is called as the folding so when the primary structure is going to fold into a proper three dimensional conformations then it is going to give you the secondary structures now the question comes how we can be able to determine the primary structures so if you want to determine the primary structures you have to first achieve the primary structures and then you can be able to uh, you can be able to uh, sequence the protein and you can be able to know the amino acid sequence of that particular proteins so these are the different uh, uh, steps what is being shown so what you can have is you can have the starting with the protein structure right so this is the three dimensionally folded protein right so here you are going to have the, uh, the tertiary and secondary structures now what you have to first do is you have to first convert that into a linear chain of amino acid which means first you have to achieve the primary uh, structures right so you it means you are actually going to unfold the protein uh, by the chemical or the enzymatic method then what you are going to do is because this length is going to be very large then you are actually going to break the uh, peptide or break the protein into in small pieces right so into small pieces and the you are going to break the small pieces like this so they are going to be uh, overlapping regions right so that you can be able to add put them these things uh, separately and then what you are going to do is you are actually going to label the uh, termini or the terminal amino acids right so you are going to have the labeling of the terminal amino acid uh, in this way right so you are going to have the labeling so labeling with the uh, fluorescent dye in different uh, 
and then you are going to do the sequencing right then you are going to identify that labeled amino acid that sequencing you can do by two methods you can use the Sanger's uh, sequencing method or you can use the Edmond degradation method so this is what it is showing here right first you are going to start with the 3d fold structures then you are actually going to uh, you know make it unfold so you are going to use the different types of treatments like you are going to use react with the fd and b and all that so that it is actually going to break the disulfide linkages and then once the it is going to adopt the primary structures then that you are going to degrade the primary structure with the help of the different types of chemicals or the enzymes and that's how you are going to get the small fragments and once you got these small fragments uh, you can actually be able to uh, do the sequencing and then once the sequencing is over then you can be able to put these blocks uh, together and that sequencing you can do either by the Edmond degradation method or to the uh, Sanger sequencing method. So let's understand so in the state 1 this, this is the stage 1 right so stage 1 you are going to convert the 3D conformations into the 1D uh, or the primary structures right so that you are going to achieve simply by in the stage one where you are first going to break the disulfide linkages so stage one stage one is the breaking of the disulfide bonds so you can imagine that this is the protein right which has a disulfide linkages and the disulfide linkages interfere with the complete sequencing procedure as it does not allow the release of the cleaved amino acid from the peptide chain there are two approaches to disrupt the disulfide linkages in a protein sequence in the first approach the protein is oxidized with a performic acid to produce the to cystic residue so why the there is a need to uh, break the disulfide linkages because if you don't break the disulfide linkages even if this particular amino acid is actually going to be labeled and it is going to be hydrolyzed it is not going to be released from the main chain because it is still having a it is bind to the main chain through a disulfide linkages and that's why it is important to break the disulfide linkages so disulfide linkages we have the two approaches in the approach one uh, you can actually use the oxidation with the performing acid and that's when you do the performing acid treatment it is actually going to break the linkage between the disulfide linkages and that's how it is actually going to give you the two fragments whereas in the approach number two uh, the protein is reduced by the DTT or beta mercaptoethanol to form the 2 cysteine followed by the treatment with the iodoacetate to form the carboxymethyl cysteine. Formation of the carboxymethyl cysteine stop the reformation of the disulfide bond. So in the approach 2 what you are going to do is you are going to add the DTT. So DTT is a reducing agent. So once you are going to reduce the disulfide linkages the S is SS is actually going to get converted into SH and that's how it you are going to have the uh, two peptide bonds where the uh, disulfide bond is broken but this this has a problem because as soon as you have the SH and you have the reducing environment it is going to be remain as SH but once it is actually going to be acquired the oxidizing environment again the SS is going to be oxidized and again, again the SH is going to be get converted into the SS double bonds so to avoid that you are again going to uh, react this with the carboxymethylene by the iodoacetate. So the, in that case then what will happen is that the S is actually going to be tagged with this particular functional group. This is going to like a and that is how it is actually going to form the carboxymethylated cysteine residue and once you have this then they will not be able to come together even if the conditions are oxidizing in nature. Now when once this is done you can actually go back to the stage 2. In the stage 2 you are actually going to break the, the big polypeptide chain into the multiple fragments. So in the stage 2, stage 2 is the cleavage of the polypeptide chain. So in this stage 2 is the cleavage of the polypeptide chain. The protease and the chemical treatments are targeting protein have a specific recognition sequence and they cleave after a particular amino acid. So this is one. 
So stage one is this, right? So stage one is over, right? Where you have actually destroyed the disulfide linkages uh, by the two approaches, what we have just discussed. And now in the stage two, you are actually going to cleave the protein with the uh, enzymatic or the chemical methods. So some of the common reagents, what you are going to use for fragmenting the polypeptide chain is that you can use the enzyme. So you can, if you use the trypsin enzyme, the trypsin has the cutting site which is actually after the lysine or to the arginine which means wherever the lysine or the arginine is present for example this is, this is these are the peptide which are being generated by the trypsin so if you treat it with the trypsin it is actually going to cut wherever you have the lysine or the arginine so for example here it has cut right here it has cut so the, wherever you have the lysine and arginine it is actually going to cut and that's why it is actually going to generate the different types of fragments. Similarly, you can use the chymotrypsin. So, chymotrypsin is actually going to uh, cleave the peptide after the phenylalanine, tryptophan or tyrosine which means after the aromatic amino acids. So, then we can also use the pepsin. So, pepsin is actually going to cleave the polypeptide chain after the leucine, phenylalanine, tryptophan or the tyrosine. And then you can also have the different types of uh, chemicals. For example, you can use the cyanogen bromide and cyanogen bromide is actually going to cleave the polypeptide after methionine. For example, these are the peptide sequences what has been generated by the cyanogen bromide. So you see this is the methionine and after the methionine it has been cut by the cyanogen bromide. Now, once you got the, these uh, small fragments, then what you can do is you can take the individual fragments and then you can sequence these small fragments. So once you got the sequence of these small fragments, then you can have to put them together and that's how you are going to get the sequence of the complete proteins. So now in the stage 3, the stage 3 you are going to do the sequencing of the uh, polypeptide chain. So these are the, you are going to have multiple polypeptide chains. So, for the sequencing of the polypeptide chain, you can have the two methods. One is you can use the Sanger's method or you can use the Edmund Rigodan method, right? So, let us first discuss about the Sanger's method. So, once the polypeptide fragments are generated, we can start the sequencing of the each polypeptide chain. It has the following steps. So, first thing is, first thing is you have to identify the N-terminus residues. The N-terminal amino acid analysis is being performed in the three step. Number one, you are actually going to label the terminal amino acids. So, as I said, you know, when the we were talking about the primary structure, so primary structure has the N-terminal thing and then it has a C terminal thing, right. So what we are doing is we are first sequencing the protein from the N terminal. So first amino acid we have to first uh, you know I, I do the sequencing from the N terminal. So for the first amino acid we are just using the uh, labeling. So we are labeling the terminal amino acids. So the chemical reaction is performed to label the terminal amino acid with the compound such as the Sanger's reagents like 1-fluoro-2,4-dinitrobenzene or DFNB and the Denzel chloride. In most of the cases, these reagents also label the free amino acid which are present on the basic amino acid side chain such as lysine and arginine. Dinitrofluorobenzene reacts with the free amino group to form the dinitrophenyl amino acid complex. So what we are going to do is you are going to take the DFNB and then you, if you add the DFNB to the first amino acid because it has the free amino group it is actually going to and in the presence of the HF so there will be a release of the this uh, group and uh, then it is actually going to form a, uh, a bond with the terminal amino, amino groups and that is how the first amino acid R1 is actually going to be labeled. Now what the step 2 what you are going to do is in the step 2 you are going to hydrolyze the peptoin. So, so the, if when you add the acid hydrolysis of the dinotrophenyl amino acid complex that lead to the breaking of the peptide bond to release the dinitrophenyl amino acid complex in the solutions. So after this once the first amino acid is been labeled, then you are going to do the acid hydrolysis and as, a, as a, uh, when you do the acid hydrolysis, it is actually going to break the bond between the first amino acid and the second amino acid and as a result, the first amino acid which is already been labeled with the DFNB, 
it's going to be released from the main chain. Then you are going to do the separation and the analysis of the derived amino acids. So a HPLC or the TLC separation of the complex and comparing it with the standard amino acid is actually going to give you the, uh, the, the, the name as well as the identity of this. So what you are going to do is once you got this uh, pro amino acid, then you can actually be able to run the TLC along with the standard TLC. So what you can do is like for example, you can run a TLC like this. So you can run all the 20 amino acid, right? So you can actually make the all the 20 amino acid in the famous, in the DFNB complex and then you can run and then you can also run the unknown sample, right? So if you run the unknown sample, it is suppose it goes to the spot here and suppose this is the arginine, right? So if it goes to this, then you can say that the this is the arginine or you can actually be able to calculate the RF value of your unknown sample and since you know the RF value of all the other amino acid complexes, you can be able to identify this. The other option approach is that you can do the HPLC and you can be able to calculate the retention values. So this is about the uh, how you can be able to use the Sanger's method to sequence the proteins. Now if you talk about the Edmund degradation method, so in the Edmund degradation method, it also has a similar kind of steps. For example, the similar to the Sanger reagents, the reagents are different like where you are actually going to use the phenyl isothionate reacts with the terminal amino group to form a cyclized phenyl thiocarbamoyl derivative. So in this case, uh, you are going to use the phenyl isothiocyanate and when it reacts with the terminal uh, R1 group right on, uh, onto the peptide, then it is actually going to form a cyclized product. Under the acidic conditions, the terminal amino group is actually going to be cleaved from the main chain as a theodoline derivative and that is how you are actually going to have the, uh, the, uh, the first amino acid as the PTH. So thiodoline derivative is extracted into the organic solvent and it forms the phenyl thiodine amino acid PTH amino acid complex into the presence of acid. So ultimately you are going to get the PTH complexes. So this is for the PTH complex of the R1 and then what you are going to do is you are going to run the PTH amino acid complex can be identified by the HPLC or TLC in comparison to the standard amino acid. Now once you have done this 1 to 4 for the first amino acid, so when you do the first step 1 to 4 for the first amino acid, uh, you can do the 1 to 4 again for the second amino acid, right? Because the first amino acid is been released, right? So the th remaining peptide chain is still there. You can use that and again do the another round of this. So if you continue this like this, it is actually going to keep giving you the amino acid sequence from the N terminus side. So if you st step one to four can be repeated for the next amino acid in the polypeptide chain and that's how it is actually going to give you the whole sequence and that you sequence if you have the different fragments if you put them together it is actually going to give you the complete uh, sequence of the all the protein peptides. Now as I said you know the protein is having the two chain types so you have the N terminus side and then you have the C terminus side right. So we have just discussed the method like the Sanger's method or the Edmund degradation method to, to identify the N terminus amino acids. But we can also do the sequencing from the C terminus and that is how you can be able to identify the C terminal residues. So how we can do that? The C terminal residues, not many methods are developed for the C terminal amino acid analysis. The most common method is to treat the protein with the carboxypeptidase to release the C terminal amino acid and test the solution in a timely dependent manner, right? So what you can do is you can just treat this with a carboxy. Um, um, carboxypeptidase. So carboxypeptidase is a specific enzyme which actually releases the amino acid from the C terminal side rather than the N terminal side. So if you use the carboxypeptidase, it is actually going to release the amino acid and these amino acids are the C terminal amino acid. So once the amino acid is released, you can identify that amino acid by the Sanger's or the Edmund degradation methods. Then the stage 4, you are going to do the ordering of the peptide fragments. So, so usage of the different uh, peptide cleavage reagents produces the overlapping 
amino acid stretches and these stretches can be used to put the whole sequence. For example, when you generate the trypsin, right, it is going to generate the first fragment like this, the second fragment like this, the third fragment like this. So, if you sequence this fragment, if you sequence the A fragment, if you sequence the B fragment, if you sequence the C fragment, so what you see here is that A is having this portion which is overlapping, C is having this portion which is overlapping with the B. So, by put doing this overlapping sequencing, you can be able to deduce the final sequence of the final uh, uh, the final length or the you can be able to put them these fragments and that is how you can be able to do the sequencing. Then the stage 5, you can actually be able to locate the disulfide bonds. So, the peptide cleaved by the the protein cleaved by the trypsin is performed with or without breaking the disulfide linkages. Amino acid sequence analysis of fragment will provide the side of the disulfide bond. The presence of a disulfide bond will reduce the two fragments, right, will reduce two fragments and will appear as a single large fragments. As we said, right, if there is a disulfide linkage present, it is not going to allow the release of the amino acid fragments. So, because of that, if there is a suppose this is the disulfide linkages right and so even if you cleave the this particular fragment right so for example if there is a disulfide linkage like this right if there is a disulfide linkage like this if you cleave this with the protease it is it ideally should give you the two fragments right but if there is a disulfide linkage it is still be going to bind right this and that's how it is actually going to give you the single fragment. So, if you get the single fragment, then there is a disulfide linkage which is present. Apart from these kind of uh, methods uh, with, and with the advancement of the mass, uh, mass data of different types of peptide fragments and all those kind of thing, the uh, mass spectrometry method is also being used. So, in the recent past, the mass spectrometry method in conjugation with the proteomics information is also been a popular tool to characterize the each fragment to deduce its amino acids. So, in this mass spectrometry data, what you are going to do is instead of doing this sequencing, what you can do is you can just simply calculate the peptide mass and that peptide mass actually because there is a complete database can be used to deduce the sequence. Uh, I have given you uh, uh, the reference. So, if you are interested more about reading the protein sequencing, you can actually be able to read through the this particular uh, reference. Now, let us talk about the secondary structures. So, secondary structures, the amino acid interact with each other and as a result, the peptide chain folds into the secondary structures. These secondary structures are the building blocks for the tertiary structures. So, these are the primary structures. When they fold, they give you the secondary structures. Secondary structures could be of two types. Either it can be alpha helix or to the beta sheets. It is a helical structure termed as the alpha helix by the linear spalling. In this structure, the polypeptide backbone is wound around a central axis with the R group of the amino acid protrudes outward from the helix bond band. In most of the protein, the helix is right handed, which means you are actually going to see the helix and in the helix, the R groups are protruding outside. So, then we have the beta sheets. This is a more extended conformation of the polypeptide chain where the R groups protrude from the zigzag structure in the opposite direction giving a alternate structure. So, beta sheets uh, could be the two types. It could be the the parallel beta sheets or the anti parallel beta sheets. So, it can be parallel or the anti parallel beta sheets, which means either the sheets, beta sheets are running in the same direction, then it is called as the parallel beta sheets. If they are running in the opposite direction, then it is called as the anti parallel beta sheets. Then we have the turns. So, these secondary structures have no definite structures. Uh, and they are present in the protein structure to change the direction of the running polypeptide. These are also found to places to connect the successive alpha helix and beta sheets. The number of amino acid and their preference in turn is not consistent. The two protein can adopt the similar 3D conformation by changing the length and keeping the amino acid in the turn region of the structures. So, turn is actually a unstructured region and it is actually not having a defined structure, but it has a very 
uh, huge significance in terms of providing the flexibility of the different types of protein structures. So, so for example, you can have the two different types of protein structures, their sequence, their amino acid sequence could be different, but they may adopt the identical structure simply by changing the length of the loops within the uh, length, right. So, you can see that these are the loops, right. So, what you see here is this green color region is actually called as the loop or the turn. Then we have the tertiary structures. So, tertiary structures, secondary structures folds to give the rise the higher order organizations commonly known as the tertiary structures. And then the tertiary structures can still be uh, packed and that is how you can have the quaternary structure. So, if the multi polypeptides are involved in the constitution of the protein, the tertiary structures of these different polypeptide chain come together to form the quaternary structures. Now, as we discuss about the methods to determine the, uh, the primary structures, right? We have discussed about the Sanger's method and the Edmond degradation method. We also would like to discuss about the methods to determine the secondary or the tertiary structures. So, what are the methods to determine the uh, secondary or to the tertiary structures? So, so, there are two approaches. One is you can use the experimental methods. So, experimental methods, there are two methods. So, you can use the X-ray crystallography or the NMR spectroscopy. And these are the two methods which you can use to determine the uh, three-dimensional structure of the proteins. For the X-ray crystallography, you can actually be able to have the very different steps, right? So, what you are going to do is, first you are actually going to isolate the protein for which you are actually identify, you want to identify the secondary or the tertiary structures. Then what you are going to do is, you are going to uh, purify this protein uh, at 100% uh, purity or more than 90% uh, purity. And once you are done the purify, purification, then what you are going to do is you are actually going to crystallize this protein. So, you are going to produce the crystals and once you produce the crystal, then you are actually going to put these crystals for the diffraction and what you are going to get. So, you are going to do the diffraction uh, of these crystals and once you do the diffraction, it is going to give you the diffraction patterns. So, what is diffraction pattern? Diffraction pattern is actually going to give you the spots around the axis. So, it is going to give you the uh, wherever the, the diffracted x-ray beam has hit the, uh, the film right and that is how it is actually going to give you the diffraction pattern. And ideally when you are want to collect the complete diffraction pattern of a protein, it has to be rotated, this, this crystal has to be rotated for an angle of 360 degrees, right? Because you can imagine, right? This is the crystal, right? Uh, you can have, right? And this crystal actually has to be rotated for 360 degrees. Then only you can be able to collect the diffraction pattern of or diffraction of all the electrons what is present. Once you have the diffraction pattern or the diffraction data, right? From the X-ray, then you are actually going to put this and you are going to analyze the diffraction data and that is how you are actually going to get the electron density map, right. Once you collect the electron density map, uh, it is actually going to give you the position of the electrons within the three dimensional, right. So, once you got the electron density map, then you are actually going to uh, fit the protein molecules. So, you can to fit the protein molecules, uh, proteins uh, molecule, right, protein, which means the protein sequence, you are going to fit the protein sequence. And once you are done the fitting, then it is actually going to give you the 3D structure of the protein. Uh, once you got the 3D structure of the protein, then you can actually do the quality assessment, right? You can do the quality assessment with the help of the three programs. You can do the Ramchandran plot. Uh, you can do the um, uh, Procheck and you can also do the top plot. So, if you do all these kind of thing, it is actually going to tell you whether the 3D structure what you have solved by fitting the, uh, the protein sequence into the electron density map is correct or not. If you get the R factor, which is uh, called as the error factor, which is uh, approximately around 20, then you are going to say that the protein what you have solved or the protein structure what you have solved using the X-ray crystallography is very good.
if you want to read more about since this course is not about the XI crystallography, you will find a very good uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, course on even in the MOOCs or as well as you can actually get a lot of good resources if you are interested to understand each and every detail about the XI crystallography. Uh, you can actually be able to even go through with this particular article and that actually will give you the very good idea about the X-ray crystallography as well as the NMR spectroscopy. Uh, same to this uh, NMR also, uh, NMR spectroscopy also has the different types of steps where you are first going to use the protein. Uh, you are going to first, uh, the first step is you are going to purify the protein, right? And uh, you know that the normal protein what we are going to get from the bacteria is not going to be labeled, not going to be NMR sensitive because it's uh, so, so first thing is you are actually going to label the protein with the NMR sensitive uh, uh, nuclei, right. For example, you can use the uh, N14 nitrogens, you can use the carbon 14, carbon 14 and uh, you can also use the uh, the hydrogen like the deuterium and so on and because of that the, the purified protein what you are going to produce is going to be NMR sensitive and then you are actually going to collect the NMR data and once you are going to collect the NMR data and you are going to analyze that data it is actually going to give you the protein structures and that protein structure is actually going to be called as the average structure right so this uh, protein structure is called as average structure because the nmr is actually going to be performed in the liquid so you can imagine that if i have a protein into the test tube so this protein actually is freely moving right so, and its uh, uh, domain and all other kind of uh, structures are also moving because of that it is actually going to give me the average structures Apart from that, you can also have the uh, non-experimental methods such as you can also do the homology modeling. So this is a useful and a fast structural solution method where the sequence similarity between the template and the target enzyme is used to model the 3D structure of the target enzyme. The homology modeling exploits the idea that the amino acid sequence of a protein direct the folding of a molecule to adopt the suitable three-dimensional conformation with the minimum energy. So what you are going to do is you are going to take, so in this homology modeling, homology modeling depends on the uh, reliability of or depend on the phenomena that the two proteins when they are actually having the similar kind of amino acids, they are actually going to adopt the similar type of folds, right? Because you know that the primary structure is actually going to direct the folding of these amino acids and that's why the when the primary structures are when the primary structure or the amino acid sequence is identical it is actually going to fold into the same cell which means if you want to use the homology model you are actually going to have the two things you are going to have a template structure right so you're going to have a template structure and you are also going to have the test amino acid sequence right now first what you have to do is you are actually going to use this particular template and you are going to use this sequence and you are going to do the multiple sequence alignment so you are going to do the sequence alignment and uh, this sequence alignment is actually going to tell you whether this particular template is good for modeling this particular amino acid sequence or not. Once this is done, then you are actually going to do two things. You are going to take the structure information from the template, right? And on this structure information, you are actually going to put the amino acid sequence, what you have from the test. And that is how you are actually going to prepare the modeled uh, protein. So once you got the model protein, then what you are going to do is you are going to test the quality of the model. And we have already discussed the quality of the test of the model can be done by Ramchandran plot 
or you can use the errata plot or you can do the pro check or you can do the verify 3D. So these are the three or four different types of groups uh, or the different types of uh, uh, programs what you can use and you can be able to uh, do the uh, the error measurements right. Once you have found that the structure is good then what you can do is you can actually be able to utilize this uh, model for the different types of applications. Uh, the programs what you can use very frequently is called as the modeler. So you can already use the modeler 9th version and that is actually going to allow you to do the modeling. So all these steps you can actually be used with the help of the modeler and then you can use the different types of programs to do the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to the, to do the quality of the model verification with the Ramchandran plot and all these kind of things. Uh, so now well, let us go move on to the methods to determine the quaternary structures. So method to determine the quaternary structures, uh, you know that the, the condition for the quaternary structure is that the protein should have the uh, multiple uh, subunits, right. Uh, so if the protein has the multiple uh, subunits, then only you can be able to perform the quaternary structures. So how we can actually be able to know that the protein has the multiple subunits. So what you can do is you can calculate the protein's molecular weight under the two conditions. One you can actually be able to calculate the protein's molecular weight under the native conditions or you can actually be able to calculate the protein's molecular weight under the denaturating conditions. So when you uh, denaturating conditions. Uh, imagine that uh, the, the molecular weight under the native condition is uh, mole n, so it is n, right? And under the denaturating conditions, if the molecular weight is mole d, then the uh, you can actually be able to calculate the oligomeric status uh, by the molecular weight native divided by molecular weight denature right. Uh, for example, so like molecule N versus molecule D. Let us take an example ok. For example, if I have calculated the, uh, uh, molecular weight and if I calculated the native molecular weight is 120 kDa and if it, I have calculated the denatured molecular weight which is the 30 kDa then the oligomeric status would be the 120 divided by 30 which means the 4 which means it is a tetramer. So once I calculated that it is actually a tetramer then I can be able to assure that there is a quaternary structure what is present. Now the, uh, now the question comes how you can be able to calculate the molecular weight of a protein under the native or the denaturating conditions. So calculation of a calculation of molecular weight right. So for the native molecular weight. Uh, what you can do is you can run the protein under the gel filtration chromatography. So if you do the gel filtration chromatography, uh, although the scope does not allow you to explain the gel filtration chromatography, but gel filtration chromatography is a chromatography technique which is actually going to filter the molecule based on the size. So if it is uh, based on the size, so if it is going to be 4 times because you are taking the 1 monomer and you are making the 4 monomers, the size is going to be 4 times, right. So that is why it is actually going to give you a pattern, right, it is going to give you a peak which is actually going to tell you that okay, this is the size at which the protein is eluted. So this is called as the elution volume and utilizing this information and as well as the distribution coefficient, you can be able to calculate the molecular weight of this particular protein and that is going to be called as native molecular weight. And now 
under what how to calculate the denatured molecular weight you can be able to calculate the denatured molecular weight with the help of the SDS page. Uh, I am sure we all know about the SDS page. So, even if you run the protein on the SDS page, it is actually going to give you the uh, molecular weight, right? So, if you run first, you run the molecular weight marker, right? So, you run the marker and then you are going to run your proteins. So, depending on the and then you calculate the RF values for the these marker proteins, right? So, if for the individual marker protein, when you calculate, you are actually going to get the RF values for each and every spot and then you can also be able to calculate the RF value for the your protein and depending on the RF value of this particular spot you can be able to calculate the denatured molecular weight. Uh, I have already discussed uh, this whole uh, thing uh, in a uh, and uh, so that is how you can be able to calculate the denatured molecular weight and once you have the uh, native molecular weight and you can have the denatured molecular weight you can be able to utilize that for calculating the oligomeric status um, which is the molecular weight native versus molecular weight uh, denatured right. So, so with this uh, we have discussed uh, about the uh, protein structures what we have discussed we have discussed about the uh, different types of uh, different types of uh, organization what is there in the protein structures we have discussed about the uh, the primary structures we have discussed about the secondary structures we have discussed about the uh, tertiary structures and we have discussed about the quaternary structures. Uh, we uh, what we have uh, so so with this we we have discussed about the protein structures and what we have discussed so far we have discussed about the primary structures, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structures. While we were discussing about the primary structures, we have also discussed about the method to determine the uh, primary structures. So, we have discussed about the Sanger's method or the Edman degradation method. So, both the methods are utilizing the similar approach where you are actually going to label the terminal amino acids and then you are going to use the acid hydrolysis so that the terminal amino acid is going to be released and that terminal amino acid, the labeled terminal amino acid going to be. Uh, identify by running it onto the thin layer chromatography and apart from that we have also discussed about the secondary as well as the tertiary structures we have discussed about the methods to determine the secondary as well as the tertiary structures and then lastly we have also discussed about the homology modeling we discussed about the x-ray as well as the NMR spectroscopy and uh, lastly we have also discussed about how you can be able to determine whether the protein is going to have the quaternary structures or not. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more aspects related to protein. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here thank you.